Welcome to the Glazov Gang. I'm Louis Leinhardt, sitting in for Jamie Glazov, and tonight we have a very special subject to talk about, the primary materials for the Islamic faith. All too often, I think, uh, a lot of the, these materials within Islam go over Westerners' heads. There are a lot of terms that are used that are not common to the Western mind, a lot of ain't old materials, and it can get a bit confusing. And I think it would be very helpful for us to understand these materials. And for that, we have a very special guest, Mr. Anthony Rogers, who is an apologist. He's a scholar. He is a debater. He has debated several Muslims, uh, other Muslim or Muslim scholars on this subject and on many others. And he's here with us via Skype to help us understand and make sense out of these materials. Uh, hello, Anthony. Welcome to the Glazov Gang. Hi, Lewis. Thank you very much. Happy to be with you. Thank you very much. Uh, Anthony, I have uh, important questions here to ask about these materials. All too often, I've been to debates, I've been to lectures, I've been to gatherings where the Islamic sources are being cited, and I see a lot of confusion in people's minds, in their face, uh, when these materials are referenced. I think it would be very helpful for us to have an understanding, a foundational understanding of these primary and secondary text sources or text materials so that when we speak to Muslims or speak on Islam, we do it from a position of an educated uh, foundation. And it's not just out of what we hear on the news or what we hear uh, out in the street or hearsay, but we actually get it from the scholars themselves or the books written by scholars that tell us what in fact Islam is. Uh, let me read to you quickly a quote that I have here. Uh, actually, it's two quotes. One is by Majid Nawaz, and he's often on the news and presenting material on Islam, and he presents it this way. We Muslims must admit that there are challenging Quranic passages that require reinterpretation today. Let us use existing tools of exegesis, such as specificity, restriction, abrogation, and metaphor. Vacuous literalism as an interpretive method must be abandoned. So Majid Nawaz is telling us that a literal interpretation of the Quran is troublesome. To contrast that, I have Shahina Sadiqi, who says this, Muslim extremists twist, abuse, and misrepresent Quranic verses and prophetic traditions to support, justify, and rationalize their hateful messages of violence and terrorism. So now we have Majid saying that we cannot take the Quran literally or we end up with what the terrorists are saying. Shahina is saying that none of these things are in the Quran, but that one must misinterpret the Quran in order to get the things that Majid says are actually there. So how do we make sense out of all of this? What is the Quran? What is the Sunnah? What are the Hadiths? What are these texts that Muslims use or reference in order for the understanding of Islam to be properly understood? Right. I think uh, this actually, and I, I understand now why you brought up the quotes, this underscores the importance of understanding the Islamic sources because that's ultimately what we're going to have to go to if we're going to want to get at the truth here of whether or not uh, Majid or Shahina uh, are telling us the truth. You know, who's right, the extremists or uh, those who give us a more docile form of Islam. Uh, and once we, we see that these are the issues confronting us and these are the things we need to sort out, uh, that brings us to the, right to the doorstep of, of this issue. Uh, and we're going to want to talk about things like what is the Quran, right? What is the uh, Syria literature? What is the Hadith? What is the uh, other relevant material? And you want to get into that right now? I, I'm not sure I Sure, about uh, but so. briefly, can you give us a little bit of background on yourself? Uh, you've had several moderated professional debates with Muslims, have you not? Yes, yes. Uh, well, first of all, I'm a student at Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary, but my involvement with Muslims and with Islam goes back a couple of decades. I took almost an immediate interest in Islam once I heard about it, and I was interacting with Muslims, so it became a relevant issue. It was uh, something that I was directly encountering, and so I wanted to know something about it. 
And that set me on a course of uh, talking with Muslims and pursuing the material that they were referring to. I was in the same position that some of the hearers that you're speaking of uh, are presently in, of not really being able to make heads or tails of this material. I'd hear one person say this, another person say that, and I wanted to know uh, what the truth was. Where does the truth lie on these issues? And uh, so I have uh, since that time been engaging in uh, debate with Muslims, uh, several public formal debates, uh, I think seven to date, uh, one most recently in Arizona about a month ago. Um, so that's a little bit of my background and experience uh, with Muslims. Okay, that's very good, Anthony, thank you. And Anthony, one more thing uh, before you get into the materials. I've researched Islam and I find that there are at least a hundred plus sects uh, of people, of groups, individuals, or uh, great numbers of followers of the religion of Islam that claim to be Islamic. Uh, there is also a hadith that says that the uh, followers of Muhammad would be divided into 73 different communities, but only one would be the true community and the rest would perish. Uh, this is also important for us to know because we do hear differences within these sects. We do hear that they have uh, uh, some differences that are minor, some that might be major. We see a lot of uh, fighting within the Islamic communities. Uh, one example is the two major sects of Shiite and Sunni where there is bloodshed in the name of their sects. So this is very important that we understand who is really representing Islam and how can we know. So with that, can you please introduce to us what the primary source material of Islam is? Okay, well, yeah, the primary source that all Muslims would recognize is, of course, the Qur'an. Uh, the Qur'an is supposed to be a uh, series of revelations that Muhammad received over the course of 23 years. And one of the things that I think is important in order for people to understand the Qur'an is not to confuse their notions of what uh, for example, in the West, one of the most uh, well-known sources that people would point to as an inspired text is the Bible. Christians, of course, look to it as God's inspired word. What Christians mean by inspiration, though, is something very different than uh, what Muslims believe. Christians, for example, believe that God, by his spirit, superintended the writing of Scripture. So he employed individuals. He used them uh, to write what he wanted, but he didn't override their personalities. So Paul, for example, when he sits down in the prison and he writes an epistle, uh, he's, he's writing his own thoughts, though these thoughts, Christians believe, were governed by God and, and Paul was kept from error. But they still express Paul's thoughts. They express Paul's personality, Paul's learning, and so forth. Muslims, on the other hand, believe that the Quran is the earthly inscription of an eternal book. They believe there was a book that existed eternally alongside of Allah, and the contents of that book were, in turn, taken by the angel Jibril, which we in English would say Gabriel. Those contents were taken and revealed to Muhammad over a period of 23 years. And so they're not considered inspired. They're not supposed to be the words of Muhammad at all. They're not supposed to reflect anything about his personality. Uh, they're not even supposed to reflect, uh, uh, you know, uh, anything that is conditioned by time. So there's, there's a very different understanding in the Muslim mind uh, when it comes to the Quran and would be in, say, the Christian mind when it comes to the Bible. And that has some serious implications for how they understand the Quran, how they interpret the Quran, how they apply the Quran, something we, we might talk about in uh, the next program. But uh, yeah, that in a nutshell is the, the, the Muslim view of the Quran. So since it's the direct verbal dictation of Allah, delivered to Muhammad by Jibreel and then recited in turn by Muhammad to people who memorized it and eventually wrote it down. Uh, Muslims uh, don't believe there's, or, or at least Orthodox Muslims, don't believe there's any wiggle room there to play with it and reinterpret it, for example, like uh, one of the uh, uh, individuals suggested, uh, what he quoted earlier, Shahina uh, Siddiqui. Thank you, Anthony. And apart from the Quran, what other writings would there be that a Muslim would appeal to? Well, uh, the next important source of Islamic inspiration, uh, of Islamic uh, uh, authority, is the Hadith literature. 
Now, this is often referred to as the second inspiration. Now, here we're actually getting into material that uh, would be thought of by Muslims in a way similar to the way Christians think of the Bible. Here we get into things that Muhammad was inspired by God to write. So they do believe that authentic hadiths coming from Muhammad are in fact inspired and therefore infallible, inerrant, and ultimately binding and authoritative, that a Muslim is obligated, uh, you know, divinely obligated to believe these things, to implement these things in their practice. Uh, so, yeah, again, this is similar, more along the lines of what Christians would think of uh, when they think of the Bible. Uh, one big difference would be that the Hadith is in, uh, considerably larger uh, than the Bible and than the Quran. Uh, so it's a very voluminous, and it, it, it would take a great deal of uh, time and effort, uh, though it's worth it uh, to get into, especially if you want to uh, really understand Muslims, Islam, and engage Muslims. And apart from the Hadith, uh, are there commentaries to the Quran that a person can uh, go to for the understanding of the context of the Quran? Yeah, Muslims actually think of their commentators much more uh, as much more authoritative than a Christian would. See, a, a Christian, for example, would look at a commentary on the Bible and they would weigh what the person is saying and, you know, make a, uh, they would assess it and see if they consider it to be valid. You know, is this uh, accurately expressing the meaning of the grammar, of the syntax, of the, of the context, and so forth. Uh, but Muslims would think of much of the tafsir literature is almost on a par with the hadith, and, and the reason for that is because very often the, the tr tafsir is just basically culling information from the hadith. They're taking the hadith, they're sifting through the supposed traditions that were narrated by Muhammad by inspiration, and they're using this to uh, interpret the Quran. So the tafsir literature is uh, a considerably high authority in Islam, especially the earlier the tafsir. So, for example, somebody like Ibn Abbas, who we have commentary from, uh, is considered like gold to Muslims. This is a uh, very significant source, very important to understanding the Qur'an. So, for example, if a Muslim were to dispute with another Muslim and they disagreed over the meaning of a verse, a trump card for any Muslim in that position would be to be able to cite Ibn Abbas and his interpretation in the tafsir, in the commentaries, uh, in order to, if you will, uh, you know, overrule what the other person is offering as a valid interpretation of a Quranic text. Excellent. And if we wanted to learn more about the life of Muhammad, what works would we appeal to in order to understand uh, basically the biography of Muhammad? Yeah, here this is what Muslims refer to as Sira literature. So it's biographical literature referred to as Sira. And there are all sorts of uh, Sira uh, that were written. Uh, the most authoritative is the one translated by uh, Alfred Gulame, uh, which uh, was written by Ibn Ishaq, and then uh, it's a recension uh, done by Ibn Hisham. So he basically took out some things from it, which it'd be very interesting to, to have some of that. But uh, this material is often looked at uh, a little bit more skeptically by Muslims. And part of the reason for that is because it's so damaging. Of course, there's a great deal of material that I would consider damaging in the Hadith and so forth. But it, uh, if we apply Western uh, critical, you know, scientific uh, reasoning to these documents, and we ask what sorts of things, uh, what, what criteria do we have for considering something valid or invalid, uh, we would find a lot more in the Sira literature of interest than some Muslims. Now, again, I'm not trying to completely downplay it. Muslims take this material uh, as important. They just they get a little more squeamish when we get into this material than they do when it comes to the Hadith and uh, then, of course, with the Quran. Uh, and just maybe an example here real quickly. Uh, some of the Hadith or the Sira literature will tell us things about Muhammad, like uh, Muhammad uh, on one occasion speaking words that supported pagan polytheism. Uh, these are famously referred to as the satanic verses. And these verses uh, Muhammad was later embarrassed by, and he you know, recanted and repented of that. And uh, he claimed that Muhammad cast those pagan supporting verses on his tongue. And Muslims aren't comfortable with that idea, the idea that Muhammad could have spoken words from Satan, thought they were from Allah, and the people could have heard them and thought they were coming from the same source as all of his other revelations 
the idea that they couldn't distinguish between any of this is very disturbing to Muslims. But, but think about this real quickly. Uh, I know you just want to know something about the sources, but real quickly, just so you get an idea of the importance of this material. Even Hasham, remember, has rescinded uh, some of the, he's abbreviated some of the material that Ibn Ishaq, who is an earlier source, actually gave us. This is material that gets left in. So if you find material that's left in by him, it's likely to be correct because, remember, he's getting rid of stuff that he doesn't like. So the stuff that's still there is very uh, much prized by those who want to know, uh, you know, solid uh, stuff about Muhammad, or at least something that we can know more solidly than some other, other things. So these, amongst other uh, materials, would basically lay the foundation for Islam, for the Muslim community, what would be called, uh, uh, from where they would get the Sharia. Is there any uh, writing that gives them their jurisprudence? Yeah, this would be known as fiqh in Islam, and that's a, a similar to tafsir, which goes to the uh, hadith to interpret the Qur'an. The fiqh is drawing from all of these sources. And just like you have in, uh, you mentioned the various sects of Islam. Uh, you know, you mentioned uh, in particular Sunni and Shia, but then of course there are a whole host of others, the Ahmadiyya, uh, the Alawites, uh, in late, earlier in history, the Muatizali. I mean, there's all kinds of sources. Uh, there's been differentiation within Islam over its 1400 year history, just like there has been in other major religions. and. Uh, so likewise, in the area of jurisprudence or fiqh, they have actually developed four main schools, four main schools that uh, Muslims of these different sects would look to. Uh, and they have a lot in common. There's a, there's a great deal in common, but they have their points of disagreement, uh, just like you might find disagreements between, say, Baptists and Presbyterians and Lutherans. A lot of commonality, a great deal of commonality, but also some relevant differences, and, and Muslims have those differences as well. Yes. Uh, but they would agree on some major issues that most Westerners would uh, have trouble with. Well, thank you, Anthony. I appreciate that. That's very uh, insightful. Uh, is there any website that anyone can go to to get any of your writings, any of your materials, and get a further understanding of this? Yeah, uh, and actually, well, the, the site that I, one of the sites that I write for is answeringislam.org, and this site is valuable not simply because I write for it, but uh, it's actually one of the single greatest resources on Islam. Uh, there's a whole host of authors, there's a lot of classical as well as modern writings that, are, that can be found there. Uh, it's a real treasure. Uh, anybody who wants to know something about Islam can turn to these sources. Now, it's written from a Christian perspective, uh, but uh, even those who are not uh, particularly Christian have found it to be, again, one of the greatest resources. For example, Ibn Warak, who's a atheist, who, he, he was a Muslim, he uh, uh, left Islam, uh, he considers it to be one of the single greatest resources responding to Islam anywhere in the world, uh, uh, his books uh, included. I mean, they, you know, it, 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 bar none, that site is a incredible resource if you want to know something about Islam. Okay, and can you give that site one more time as we're running uh, out of time here? Yes, sir. Answeringislam.org, and you'll find mirror sites in many different languages, so the site is, uh, you know, valuable for uh, people in other languages as well. Um, it, again, a credible resource, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of articles that are uh, found on that site. Fantastic. Thank you, Anthony, very much. And, Anthony, if you can join us again to give us an understanding of how to apply these sources. Uh, we would really appreciate to have you back. Thank you, Lewis. I'm um, happy and grateful to be on. Thank you. And thank you, folks, for joining us on the Glasov Gang. And stay tuned for part two of this great and insightful uh, interview with Mr. Anthony Rogers. Thank you and good night.